So the wedge, uh, the surplus sharing solution to the bargaining problem or the surplus sharing uh, procedure yields uh, a weight function So the wedge function that depends on um, certain key parameters, of course, the bargaining power, the value from unemployment, the marginal product of labor, which is labor productivity A if the function is linear, and the tightness theta. And you know, if we want to also include it, the recruiting cost f. And that function is given by the expression that, that we've just obtained. Um, so that's kind of a complex function. It depends on parameters, the bargaining power, the value of unemployment, the recruiting cost, as well as endogenous uh, variables in the model. So variables are determined by the equilibrium in the model. That's the tightness here and the marginal product of labor here. Okay. Um, and something that's um, quite interesting, if you read, uh, so a couple of things that are interesting. So first, if you read the Pisarides chapter um, that I've assigned on Canvas, uh, so you'll see Pisarides doesn't use uh, the surplus sharing solution to the bargaining. He uses Nash bargaining. In his model. Um, the model also has a slightly um, different setup. There are some assumptions that are uh, slightly different. Um, but what's quite interesting is that actually with Nash bargaining, what Pisagas shows is that you will obtain exactly the same wedge function as um, with the surplus sharing approach. So Nash bargaining is exactly the same. Uh, function as a surplus sharing approach. Of course, the advantage of the surplus sharing approach is that we'll be able to use it in a much broader uh, range and context. But here, we obtain exactly uh, exactly the same solution. And you can see that. Um, you can see that its equation 1.20 in the Pisarides uh, chapter which is exactly the same, except that uh, what we call MPL here, the marginal product of labor, is just P in the PCIDES textbook, and what we call R, the routing cost, is called C uh, in the PCIDES textbook, but you obtain exactly the same. So that's good. So if you read about um, Nash bargaining in papers, you know that Nash bargaining is, at least in a simple setup, is exactly the same as what you would get with, uh, with surplus sharing. Okay, So that's something that's, uh, that's good. Um, the other thing is that we can derive a couple of uh, properties from that uh, solution that are useful to always keep in mind. Um, so um, first property that we want to look at is what happens if uh, workers have all the bargaining power. That's a just interesting um, special case to look at. So that means the bargaining power is 1 and the wedge is equal to, so if we go up, see our expression, the wedge is just going to be equal to uh, MPL 1 plus R theta. So here what we see is that if workers have all the bargaining power, the wage is given by this, and so the wage will be greater than the marginal uh, product of labor for any uh, tightness. But now, of course, that's not sustainable because firms hire workers. These workers give them, you know, provide the marginal product of labor. 
the marginal workers, you know, the last workers they hired is a marginal point of labor. But here we see that if workers have all the bargaining power, the firm has to pay that worker more than the marginal product of labor. So for, from a firm's perspective, it's not worth hiring anybody here. So if you have a bargaining power of one, in fact, firms wouldn't be interested in hiring any workers. And that's not very surprising because we know that firms have to uh, pay the producers their wage, but they also have to pay uh, recruiters a wage. Although recruiters do not, they are required to find workers, but they do not deliver, they do not produce any goods or and services that firms can sell. So in a sense, they are part of the uh, overhead of the firm. And so because firms have some overhead to cover on top of the wage that they pay the producers, the only way that running a firm is profitable is if you pay uh, all workers slightly less than the marginal product of labor, because you need to make some profit on the producers to cover uh, the overhead that you incur, that you incur on the recruiters. Um, so the only way that firm would accept to operate is if the, if the wage was at least strictly less than the marginal product of labor, so they could extract a bit of profit that they used to pay for their human resource departments, if you want. Um, so here, it's not surprising that we find that, in fact, no firms would operate if firms had all bargaining power. Um, another case that's interesting that we can look at is what happens if firms have all bargaining power. So that would correspond to uh, beta is equal to zero. Workers have no bargaining power. In that case, if we plug beta equal to zero to the equation above, the one we derived earlier, that one, what do we get? What we see immediately, the wedge is just going to be equal to z. Okay. So basically, if firms have all bargaining power, they are just going to pay uh, workers the same amount than what they would get if they were unemployed. They are going to extract all the surplus. Uh, and so here workers would really get no surplus from working. Okay? So that's another, uh, that's another extreme situation. Now, in the more you know, general case and more interesting case where the bargaining power is more than zero and strictly less than one, we can also get a bunch of properties of, uh, of this wedge function. So what we can see is that uh, the wedge increases if the value of unemployment increases. So if workers have a better out, what we call outside option, so the outside option is what you do if you don't take a job, so here you're unemployed. But if workers have a better outside option, their outside option improves, so maybe because unemployment benefits become more generous, such for instance what happened during um, the last, during, or during the current COVID recession, there was a big increase in the generosity of unemployment benefits. Um, in that case, the Z would go up and we would expect wages to go up. We can also see that the wage is going to go up if the marginal product of labor goes up. Okay. So if worker becomes more productive, uh, they are going to be paid more through bargaining. So of course, if worker becomes more productive, the surplus from the match between worker and firm is larger, and therefore uh, workers are able to extract a higher wage, which is in line with what we see in the real world. Um, we've seen that when workers are more productive, generally they are paid more. Uh, and something else that we can see is that if the tightness goes up, on the labor market, and the wage is also going to go up. What's the logic here? Well, that if the tightness goes up, two things happen. So on the, for firms, it means that it's going to be uh, more costly to find a new, you know, a new replacement for the worker if, if uh, they don't strike a deal because if you have a higher tightness, the rate at which you fill vacancy falls, so you're going to spend more time looking for a worker if you can find an agreement now. Um, so if the tightness is, is higher, finding a, filling a vacant job is, is, uh, takes longer, you need to allocate more human resources to that, so 
from the firm's perspective, if you have a higher tightness, it's much more costly to replace uh, to replace the worker. So that means that um, firms are more reluctant to let workers go, um, and as a result, uh, workers are able to extract a higher wage. On the worker side, also something is playing in their favor if you have a higher tightness. If you have a higher tightness, you find a job more quickly. So if you're a worker and there is a very tight labor market, you know that even if you say no to this firm and you go back to the pool of unemployment, very quickly you'll be able to find uh, a new job. Um, just because when you have a high tightness, the job finding rate is very high. So when you have a high tightness, firms are not in a good situation because it would take a long time to fill a vacancy if they didn't strike a deal. Workers are in a very good situation because it's very quick to find a job out of unemployment, even if you don't agree on this deal. And so because a higher tightness shifts you know, outside option away from firms and towards workers, workers are able to extract a higher wages in that case. All right, um, so uh, these are the main properties of um, the wage that comes out of um, surplus sharing. So now we've seen three uh, wage functions that are the most typical in the literature and the one that we're going to study. A fixed wage, in which the wage doesn't move. A rigid wage, in which the wage moves but not as much as the productivity. And a, bar and, you know, a bargain wage that comes out of our surplus sharing. Now what we can do is plug these wage functions in our equilibrium condition, the condition that says that supply is equal to demand on the labor market, and we can see how supply and demand respond to shocks and how the model generates uh, business cycle fluctuations. 